Uh, you know, as I was praying for God to give me the words to speak here this morning, he kept asking me and over and over again, why do you keep looking? What are you searching for? Why do you continue to walk through life always looking for something else? You continue to long after things. You continue to want stuff. You continue looking for the next big thing in your life. And every time he asked me that, he would say, it's never enough. You keep looking. I don't understand why you keep looking. But every time, he would always come back to the same statement. You have all you need. You already have everything you need. Stop looking. Stop searching. Stop longing. Stop the search, church. This morning, we stopped the search. And if you're anything like me, you're really confused about what he's talking about. But then he's going to take us through scripture this morning, church. You see, we go through life always wanting more stuff. We always want more. Maybe it's more love, maybe more money, maybe more drugs, maybe more alcohol, maybe more promotions, maybe more significant others. Whatever it is, we always want something more, church. It's never enough. And we convince ourselves it's the next thing, that's it, that's what's going to finally make me happy. It's this next promotion at work. It's the next car, it's the next house, my next boyfriend, my next girlfriend, my next tie. That'll that'll finally be the one that makes me happy and, and gives me fulfillment in life. We're never content, church. We're always looking, we're always searching, never content. As God started to take me through Scripture, He kept telling me over and over again, Stop the search. You see, the constant searching for fulfillment in what the world has to offer will leave you wanting more every single time without fail. I guarantee it. It will. If you chase the things of the world and you consume your life with always trying to get more and more and more of what the world has to offer, every single time, church, it ends in a desire for even more. It's a treadmill that never slows down, church. The faster you run, the faster the world cranks it up. You will never keep up. And eventually, if you spend your life on that treadmill, you're going to get so worn down, the world is going to beat you up so much, you're going to be so tired that the treadmill is going to spit you right off the backside of the machine. You know, I was at Planet Fitness yesterday, and Tyler Gabbert was there with me. I don't think he's here this morning, but Tyler was there with me. And I said, hey, brother, we always run one mile after we're done working out. And I said, today, I usually set the treadmill on like 7. And I said, today, I think I'm going to turn it on 11. And he looked at me like, are you nuts? But I did it. I turned it up to 11. And about 15 seconds into that journey, church, I was cranking her down to four. I was, <laughs> I was run, I had the machine set on a speed that was faster than I could keep up with it. But that's how we live our lives, church. We get on the, the treadmill that the world has to offer us, and we crank that sucker all the way up to 25. We are not conditioned to run that fast. We are conditioned to run at about a four, church. But we convince ourselves that we're in better shape than what we're in. We can handle more hours at work and still be a good parent. That's what we tell ourselves. We crank it up a little faster. Listen, I can probably squeeze one more car payment into the budget. We crank it up a little faster. Listen, I know the house is a little bit of a stretch, but I really want it. It's really going to make me feel important. We crank it up even faster. And before you know it, you're looking over at your neighbor and he's looking at you saying, are you crazy? You've got yourself on a treadmill that you can't keep up with, church. Every single time we look in the wrong places for what we need. And you know why we do it? Because we're looking for something we already have. We're looking for that thing that's going to make us happy. Church, I've got news for you this morning. Scripture's got news for us this morning. You've already got what you need. You've already got what you're looking for. It's a lesson that King Solomon learned the hard way. 2 Chronicles 9, verses 22 through 28 says, King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings on the earth. All the kings of the earth sought an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift. Articles of silver and gold, robes, weapons, spices, horses, and mules. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for his horses and chariots and 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. 
The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from all other countries. You see, King Solomon was the richest king in the history of the world. He had 12,000 horses. He had so much silver, there, he had more silver than they had stones in the city. And his horses weren't just normal horses, church. They were imported horses. They were super special. He didn't just go onto the lot at Depolts and pick out his horses. Right? He had them custom ordered. They shipped them in from other countries for Solomon. He was rich. He was probably the richest human being, King Solomon, probably the richest human being that has ever lived on this planet, church. He had everything. Money, he had it, and lots of it. Women, he had as many as he wanted. Horses, 4,000 stalls full of 12,000 horses. Silver, more than all the stones in the city. Gold, nobody's ever had more. King Solomon, according to the world standard, had made it. He was the big dog. He should have been full of happiness. He should have never had a bad day. He had everything that the world said he needed. He was powerful. Scripture tells us he ruled from coast to coast. He had all the power a human being could have. But his words, vanity, vanity, he says, all is vanity. King Solomon, with all that stuff at the end of his life, in the book of Ecclesiastes, says, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. This is the man that had it all, church. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. This is Solomon writing this. Meaningless, meaningless, he says. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come, generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets, and it hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south, turns to the north. Got my directions wrong. The wind blows to the south, turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its, full, its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. You see, God took me through the words of Solomon. He said, listen, you're searching for stuff. I'm going to take you to the guy that had everything. And I want you to read his words, and I want you to see the conclusion that he came to. Because the conclusion that he came to is the same conclusion that you're going to come to in your life if you're not careful. And God started to break down Ecclesiastes chapter 1. We're going to focus on first thing on verses 3 and 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, What do people gain from their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. What is it right now that you are gaining from, through all your labors, church? Think about it in your own head. What are you gaining? And listen for a second. I'm not saying, and God's not telling us, Hey, listen, just quit your job. You don't need to pay your bills. That's not what God's saying. But in this country, church, we do more than that. We wake up because we have been on that treadmill for so long, we have accumulated all this stuff that now we have to pay for. And when we look back, we say, I didn't even need half of this stuff. You realize we live in a country, church, and my wife's not here this morning, so I can say this without the fear of being beaten on the way home. Do you realize that we live in a country where we actually put all of our extra junk in our driveway and other people comes and buys our stuff? We do. It's ridiculous. We literally put junk in the driveway and other human beings come and pay us to take our junk. We buy each other's junk. And I guarantee you right now, I've got some of all y'all's junk in my basement right this second. And I promise you, yeah, thank you, Glenn. Probably lots of your stuff. And I'm telling you, if you want it back, church, you pay attention to the newspaper. And when Leslie has the next garage sale, please show up. 
Please take your stuff back. Church, we work so that we can work. That's all we do. We work so we can buy stuff, and we buy stuff, and then we have to work. We're on the treadmill, church, and right now some of us are pretty comfortable. Maybe our treadmill's going at a fairly decent speed, and we can keep up with it for right now. But what happens when the unexpected pops up in your life? What are you going to do when all of a sudden you got a $15,000 medical bill and you've, you've been on this treadmill, but now the world's cranked it up on you and now you got to run even faster? Eventually, church, we're going to find ourselves on a treadmill going so fast, there's no choice but to let it spit us off the back end of it. If your job, if your labor is all you do, if your job takes priority in your life over your family, over what God tells you to do in Scripture, if your job has become who you are as a human being, church, it's time to refocus on Scripture. It's time to refocus. You know, in men's group, we used to talk about this all the time. It's such a weird thing we do, especially guys. I know most of the guys in the room are going to be able to relate to this. When my wife introduces me to a new friend or uh, one of her friends from high school and I meet the husband, the very first question I ask her about the guy is, what does he do? What does he do for a living? You see, in our minds, we have identified people by their jobs. They are not people anymore. The, the friend that I met yesterday is a banker. The, the guy I met last week, he's a mechanic. The, the lady I met uh, at work, she, she owns a daycare. She babysits. Uh, the, the lady I went to high school with, she's the president of the local bank. No, they're not that at all, church. They're human beings. They're God's creation. They're kids. They're God's kids. They are not their occupation, but in our own minds, we've done the same thing to ourselves. We introduce people, we tell them what we do for a living. It doesn't matter, church. That stuff does not matter at the end of time. Just like Solomon said, meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. And I know that's not always easy to hear, but it is true. Here's what happens, too. We participate in this game that the world has us playing. And we chase that carrot. We want that next thing. It's the next car. I've just got, you know, a, a couple more weeks of, of as much overtime as I can handle, and I can finally get that new car. And then you finally get that carrot. You finally rip the carrot off the stick that the world's been teasing you with. And before you know it, there's another carrot in front of your face. Now it's a, now it's a new house. Now I've got to have X amount of dollars in the bank. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. There's always a carrot right in front of us, church. It never goes away. I need a bigger house. Guess what? There's no such thing. Because the second you get the bigger house, you're going to need a bigger one. I need a new car. No such thing. Within six or seven months, you're going to hate that car and want a new one. I need a promotion at work. It'll never be enough, church. You're going to get the promotion and you're immediately going to think you need the next one. I've lived that life, church. I have lived it. I need all this fancy jewelry, you tell yourself. You finally reach that carrot and you realize that it has not brought you the fulfillment that you thought it would because you are searching for something you already have. A fresh, new, juicy, ripe carrot. Carrots are disgusting, by the way. I don't even know why we chase them. But a fresh, new, juicy carrot's thrown right in front of your face and there you go, cranking that treadmill up, convinced that if you just run a little bit faster, you can finally get it. You are not going to get that carrot, church. You're not going to get it. I promise you, you will not. If we listen to what the world says, church, and we play this game and we continue to play it, if we continue to waste our time playing this game, I promise you right now, you will never be satisfied. How do we know that? Because God tells us so in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 8. That's the next verse God stops us on in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. It says, all things are wearisome, more than one can say. Listen to what Solomon says here. Remember, the richest human being on the planet says, the eye never has enough seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What Solomon's telling you is your eyes are never going to see enough stuff. Your ears are never going to hear enough. They are always going to want more. Our desires left unchecked will never be enough for us. We want, and then we want more, and then we want more, church. But we must remember, it's not what we want that is important. You see, in this country, we do such a great job of confusing our wants and our needs. 
And here's why we do it, because we're selfish. Because in our mind, the world revolves around us. I want a new car, so I allow myself to convince myself that I need the new car. I want more money, so I convince myself that I need more money. I want the new house, so I convince myself that I need the new house. Our way is the right way, we think. Our wants are needs. They're not wants at all. It's what we tell ourselves because we have forgotten that He is all we truly need. A relationship with Christ is all you need, and you've already got it, hopefully. If not, today's the day. We're to remind ourselves that it's His plans, not ours, that are important. Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1-3 through 3 says, To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answers of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them, Scripture tells us, but motives are weighed by God. Commit to the Lord in whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. You see, we spend all our time marching after stuff that that we think is going to bring us happiness. And Scripture says right now, it's commitment to the Lord that will establish your plans. It's commitment to God that will make you happy. We commit to the Lord knowing that when we do that, He established our plans. And when we allow him to establish the plans, that's when we start to live life differently. Sure, our plans are important. Sure, our wants are important to us. But did you know, church, at the end of time, did you know not even at the end of time, in 50 years, your wants, needs, desires, nobody's going to remember them. Nobody's going to care what you wanted in 2021. Nobody's going to care what kind of car you drove. In, in 50 years, nobody cares what kind of car you drive right now. Let's be honest. What you want, church, will not be remembered. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 11 is our next stop. No one remembers the former generations. And even those yet to come will not be remembered by the ones who follow them. Think about your own family, church. Think about your own family for just a second. What did your great-grandfather worry about? You have no clue. What did your great-grandfather want in life? What What were his desires? What did he think that he needed in life? You have no clue whatsoever. What did your own grandparents want in life? I think back to my grandma and grandpa. I have no clue what they wanted. I have no clue what kind of car my grandpa wanted to drive. I have no clue what kind of house my grandmother dreamed of when she was a little girl. Here's what I do remember, though. I remember going to their house and spending time with them. I remember learning lessons from my grandparents. I remember going over to their house on Christmas morning. That's the stuff I remember. I remember the time they invested into my life. That's the stuff I remember. The car that my grandparents longed after that they finally got, I do remember one car they got, and some of y'all are going to be able to relate to this. We would drive to Wrigley Field in a van the size of a semi-trailer. I'm not kidding you. Had actual metal window blinds in it. I am not kidding you, church. It was massive. We could fit the whole family in it. There are, some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. I hear the laughs. I'm telling you, if we wanted to, we could have Thanksgiving dinner in that van. There was an f- eight-sided table in it. I am not joking. It was like a camper. It was massive. We, they drove it everywhere. I'm, I am serious, church. It was awesome. I want one of those vans, by the way. Listen, I know we're talking about once. If anybody has one of those vans, I would love to drive one home and tell my wife it's our new vehicle. <laughs> It's incredible. I love it. If you see the van parked in the parking lot next week, you know I've been kicked out of the house and I'm living in the van. So, hey, listen, my home is your home. Stop by. Have some coffee, okay? Listen, the point is, church, we get wrapped up. We only have a short time on this planet. And we get wrapped up in the things that are not important. Your former generations in your own family... The former generations that are not remembered, church, they were but a vapor. And it's easy to talk that. It's easy to say that about former generations. But we are as well. James chapter 4 verse 14 says, You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? 
you're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. The things that keep you up at night that you're worried about, the things that we find ourselves striving for, for the most part, church, do not matter. Let me repeat that. The things that you are worried about right now, this is important, the things that you are worried about right now, 99.999% of the things you're worried about do not matter. I know it's hard to hear because you think they're important things, but I'm telling you, in the grand scheme of things, it makes no difference. I had a pastor in Terre Haute that used to say, hey, listen, I worry a lot, and he does, and listen, I'm preaching to the choir. I worry probably more than any human being in this sanctuary right now. I am a worry wart, and it works because most of the stuff I worry about never happens, church. The things that you are worried about right now are not going to happen, most likely. Stop worrying about things and live life, church. Stop worrying about things and relish the moment God has given you right now to make a difference in the world. They don't matter because we worry about the wrong things. That new house, 10 years ago, is not going to matter in your life. Sure, it's nice now. Sure, it's great to have a nice home to go to, go home to, your great-grandkids are going to have no idea probably even where you lived. That new car, yep, it's nice to go out in the parking lot and see a shiny brand new car and get inside of it, make the world think you're something special. 15 years from now, not going to matter one bit. 30 years from now, the thing's going to be sitting in a junkyard full of rust, church. All that jewelry that you wear, yep, looks nice. Looks nice to you. 20 years from now, it's not going to matter. Not going to matter one bit. It's going to sit in a drawer or a safe, and you're never going to put it on again. We get wrapped up in the world because it's what we've been conditioned to do, and the faster you run, the faster the treadmill goes. You're going to exhaust yourself. Here's what we do when we stay on that treadmill too long, church. You're going to burn yourself out. You are going to ruin relationships in your life right now. You're going to ruin them. You are wasting the time. We are wasting the time that God has given us right now. I need that new house. No, you don't. The guy under the bridge needs food. I really need that new car. No, no, that's not a need at all. The single mom that that has no money, she needs milk for her baby. That's a need. I need that promotion. No, you don't. Your unsaved family member or coworker needs Christ. We look at things all backwards, church. We don't need anything in this country. Let's make that perfectly clear right now. The poorest amongst us in the United States of America are filthy rich when you compare us to the rest of the globe. Listen, if you're eating a meal today, one meal, if you have shoes on your feet right now, you are in the richest 1% of the globe's population. It's crazy to think about, church, but it is true. We convince ourselves that God's just the God of the United States. He sees the whole globe. You know, in Scripture, we talked about this in men's group one time. In Scripture, God tells us that it is easier for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the gates of heaven. And he says that because when you're rich and you're trying to accumulate stuff, you're not focused on doing what he tells you you need to do. And, and I used to read that and think, yeah, rich people, It's going to be really hard for you to get into heaven, you rich guy. It's going to be really hard for you to get get into heaven, you multimillionaire. And then I realized, church, we are those rich people. When God looks down at his entire creation and and he sees, hey, listen, I I blessed you with with a nice pair of shoes. Why didn't you walk across to that guy sleeping on the bench in those shoes that I gave you and pray with him? You see, we don't take advantage of what God's given us because we think he's talking about other people. When I would read that passage, I had no clue for a long time that God was talking to me. Hey, listen, it's going to be harder for you to get to heaven than to pass a camel through the needle if you're not careful. He's talking to us, church. And here's what we do to the world. We accumulate stuff. We get a lot of stuff, cars, houses, money, jewelry, whatever it is. We get all this stuff. And then we go around telling the world, man, God is good to me. Look at what God has blessed me with. God is so good, he blessed me with this house. God is so good, he blessed me with this car. And that's true, God has blessed you immensely. But what about the guy sleeping under the bridge? What about the family 
who can't afford the new car? Does God not bless them just as much as he blesses us? Listen, God fixed your marriage so you can go help fix someone else's. That's why you say God is good. Not because he fixed your marriage, but because he's equipped you to go help his other kids. God has blessed you with a great income so you can help someone else. That's why we say God is good. Not because we have a bunch of money, but because God has blessed us with enough income that we can go help the single mom that needs help with milk. That's why God has blessed us immensely in this country. Listen, he blessed you with that new car so that you will see the homeless man as you're driving the car to work. Your blessings, church, are intended for other people as well. He's blessed you with the vehicle so you will see stuff that you wouldn't see if you didn't have it. We search and search and search day after day after day for something that we already have. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says, My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Church, we are not waiting on that scripture to be fulfilled. It already has been. You see, he's already met your needs. You already have everything you need in life you have right now. If you're sitting in here and you're saying, you're nuts, man. I don't have a house. I'm homeless. What do you mean God's given me everything I need? What do you mean God has has blessed me? I don't even have a home. You woke up this morning. You woke up this morning with your salvation intact. You woke up this morning with a fresh new set of 24 hours to go out and spread the gospel. Scripture says, look at the birds. They don't worry about anything. They don't reap or sow. They eat every single day. Have you ever seen a bird worry? Huh? If you say yes, I'm really concerned about you, by the way. (laughs) Birds don't worry. They do not worry. They know when they wake up, they've got a meal on the ground. God's provided it, and they know it. The same is true for us, church. Scripture tells us that we are co-heirs with Christ. A co-heir, think about that for a minute. If you're an heir... If you, if you have a massive inheritance coming, you're probably not worried about a whole heck of a lot in life. Because you know, hey, listen, I don't have much to worry about. I've got a massive inheritance coming. Every single one of us has a massive inheritance coming in Christ. What are we so worried about? Be like the birds. Go help other people. Use what God has given you to bless someone else today, church. That's what we're called to do. If we're not happy in 2021, it's on us. If I ever go through periods of time where I am not content with my own life, that is on me. That is because I have got my priorities mixed up. And I do from time to time, church. I do. I find myself wanting, wanting, wanting. And then I think about the people. You know, I think about sometimes I have a problem. Happens a lot at work. I do. I have problems at work get frustrated with the way things go. And then I think, you know what? Today in Charleston, Illinois, somebody will be diagnosed with cancer. Today in Charleston, Illinois, someone's going to find out their mom has breast cancer. Been there, church, done it. And at that immediate moment when my dad came in the office and said, your mom's got breast cancer, I didn't worry about anything else. I forgot about the stuff that worried me. Immediately in that moment, my priorities shifted almost instantaneously, church. I started to think about the things I should have done in the past that I didn't. And I vowed right then, I am going to try to live life differently from here on out. Do I succeed all the time? Absolutely not. No way I fail over and over and over again. But here's what I do know now. The stuff I worry about does not matter in the grand scheme of things. If I am not worried about saving souls, nothing else matters, church. My family saved. Not worried about them anymore. Now my concern is about the people that aren't. That is what we should be focused on all the time. And when you do that, you're doing what God has called you to do. And when you do what God has called you to do, do you think for one moment God's going to let you down? Not going to happen. If you're doing what he's asked you to do, he will provide for you day after day after day. Maybe you're homeless right now because he knows there's another homeless human being that you're going to cross paths with that's not saved yet. 
Maybe you got fired from your job. Maybe he allowed, allowed certain situations to happen in your life because there's someone else that he is sending to you that you have got to be equipped to, to relate to, church. How are we spending our time? Why do we spend it on that dang treadmill? Running's terrible anyway. Darren runs like 55 miles a day. And every time I pass him, I think, Darren, are you nuts, brother? He like, he never gets tired. He runs and runs and runs. It's exhausting if you're not equipped, church. And we are not equipped to chase after the world's goods. It's not what we're called to do. I'm going to close with this. The reason that we accumulate stuff is because it makes us feel important. The reason that we collect things is because it makes us feel like we have a purpose and a place in life. No matter what you spend your life chasing, church, chasing it just for the sake of collecting it and hoarding it, accumulating stuff just for the sake of accumulating stuff is not what you were sent to this planet to do. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 10 through 12 tells us what happens at the end of our time on this earth. Strangers will consume your wealth. Someone else is going to enjoy the fruits of your labor. This is the Bible's talking here, church. Someone else will enjoy the fruit of your labor. In the end, you will groan in anguish when disease consumes your body. You will say, how I hated discipline. If only I had not ignored all the warnings. Strangers will consume your wealth, church. Strangers will enjoy the fruits of your labor. And at the end of the time, at the end of our days, when you know for a fact, I've only got a little bit longer on this planet. If we spend our whole life on that treadmill, you're going to say the same exact thing that Solomon said. Meaningless, meaningless. All is meaningless. Do you think there's ever been anybody on their deathbed that is thinking, man, I really hope I can live long enough to buy that Jeep. Man, I really hope God gives me two more years so I can finally buy that house. No, here's what you're saying. I wish I would have told my parents I loved them more. I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. I wish I would have read Scripture more so I understand the promises God made me. I wish I would have reached out to that drug addicted coworker that needed Christ. I had the answers all. I had the answers the whole time. I knew exactly where he should go. I knew scripture and I was afraid to tell him about it because I was too busy running on that darn treadmill. John chapter 14 verse 1 says, "Do not let your hearts be troubled. Stop worrying," it's telling us. He's telling us right there, "Stop worrying." You believe in God, believe also in me. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 20 says, Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers. And blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers. What is the instruction we are to give heed to? Acts chapter 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus had given me. What's the task? That verse goes on to say the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Scripture says, listen, give heed to instruction. Do what I'm telling you to do. You're going to prosper. Don't worry about it. I've got you. I know what you need. And you're going to be given what you need. Every single day, you're going to wake up, you're going to have all you need every day. Guaranteed, if you're following the Lord. Guaranteed. It's not a maybe. There's not a question mark at the end of that. It is guaranteed, church, because he tells us so. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 says, He says to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go tell people about my son. It doesn't say, hey, listen, I need you to start a Roth IRA at your job. And once you get a certain amount of money in that retirement fund, I want you to take it easy and I want you to go into the world and preach the gospel. Not what it says, church. It says go into all the world and preach the gospel. No parameters attached to that. Nothing attached to those commands. Do what I say to do and I will do what I tell you I'm going to do. That's what God tells us. 
Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right there, you cram all those scriptures together. God's telling us, go into the world and love people. And when you do it, stop worrying. Go into all the world and love me. Trust in me. And when you do it, stop worrying. If you do not have time to follow those simple commands, church, we've got our calendars too full. If you don't have time to do those things, you are on a treadmill that is going to spit you right off the back end of it before too much longer. Been there, done it. Been there, done that. I used to be so obsessed with my job. I can remember one vacation in particular. I abso- here, here's a sign you got a problem, guys, and I'm really speaking to the guys here. Here's a sign you got a problem. If you don't enjoy vacation, you got a problem. You have a problem, and I've been there, church. I took my family clear to Boston, probably one of the coolest vacations I've ever been on in my life, and I can remember convincing my wife I had to go do something over here so that I could call my job and check up on them. I was so consumed with being on that treadmill. I was missing the blessings that God put right in front of me. And now I think back and I think, Who did God send me in Boston? Who who did God allow me to cross paths with with, that needed his word, that needed his encouragement, and I missed it because I was paying attention to the wrong things? It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. I still struggle with it myself, church, but it's time to turn the treadmill off. Get off the darn thing. They're not fun anyway. Sorry, Darren, but running is not fun. (laughs) Darren's going to fill out a complaint card after service today. (laughs) People, I'm just going to be honest with you. People around you do not really care what you're worried about. They're going to act like they do to your face. They're going to tell you, yeah, I'm praying for you. No, they're not. Most likely, no, they're not. Man, I know you've got a really bad time. You're going through a rough time. I feel, you know, I'm really worried about you. No, they're not. No, they're not. Because they're consumed with their own worries, church. They don't have time to worry about you because they're worried about themselves. That's, what, that's how we are. I don't have time to worry about you if I'm worried about myself. And God tells me right here, stop worrying about yourself and worry about them. That's what we're called to do. Be concerned with the people around you. We come into church every Sunday morning as a body of believers, right? And here's the deal. 99.9% of you have already received Christ. So literally, I am preaching to the choir here. You all already have what Scripture has to offer us. We're all saved, hopefully. And if you're not, come see me or John right after service. You already have this stuff. Sunday morning is just a reminder. We're we're to come in here and remind ourselves not to worry about ourselves, but to go into the world like he tells us to do and tell people about Christ. He has blessed you so that you can do that. We live in the richest nation this world has ever seen and will ever see. We are so rich, church. Pastor Brad tells a story. They went on a mission trip to another country. This is before we moved back. They had a church. Just a mud hut That's all it was. It was nothing special. They didn't have a coffee bar out front. They didn't have any of the stuff. They didn't have comfortable chairs. They had a dirt floor and a mud, mud walls. I mean, it was a hut. They got a massive flood in the area. The night before church, a massive flood in the area. The immediate thought was, well, the service is going to be canceled because there's been a massive flood in the area. They showed up to church, and the building was full of people standing in water up to their knees because they understood I am supposed to do what God tells me to do, and he tells me to trust him and worship him. It doesn't say just to do it when we're comfortable. It doesn't say don't go to church if the air conditioning don't work. Oh, woe is me. It doesn't tell us that. It says worship me. But you know, here's the thing I've thought about ever since Pastor Brad told that story. And I'm embarrassed to tell you what my answer was immediately when I asked it to myself. If somebody called me right now 
and said, hey, the campus at Charleston has water halfway up the walls in the sanctuary, my immediate thought would be, we've got to let people know we're not having church. We've got to let people know we're closed this week because we're spoiled rotten. There are literally people having church in mud huts up to wa- in water up to their knees, church. It's crazy the, the way we've been spoiled, and it has changed the way we've lived our lives, and it's not for the better. We've been so blessed, we think we deserve it all. We don't deserve a darn thing. We don't earn anything on our own without Christ. He gives to us so that we can give to other people. And until you figure that out, you are not going to have contentment. You are never going to feel fulfilled, church, if you're chasing stuff. We've been searching for things to make us happy, to give us a sense of fulfillment from the very beginning of time. Adam and Eve, they wanted fulfillment. They were looking for something they already had. They thought they needed that piece of fruit that God told them they didn't need. But they thought, man, if I just eat that one bite, if I just get that one thing, then we're really going to have it figured out. Then we're really going to be able to enjoy our lives. They had forgotten that they already had what they needed, church, and we have too. As you sit here right now, I don't care how much money's in your bank account. I don't care if it's a six-digit figure in that account. I don't care if there's a minus sign in front of your balance. You have all you need right now in Christ. It's time to stop the search. It's time to shut the treadmill off, church. And it's time to go into the world and tell people that they too can have all they need the second they accept Christ. And listen, if you're sitting out here this morning and you have not done that yet, today is the day. Once you accept him, church, I promise you, at that very moment you have everything you need. Once you're guaranteed a spot in heaven, once you're guaranteed a spot in the club, you've got all you need. You're a VIP. You're a co-heir with Christ. And once you're a co-heir with Christ, once you fully comprehend that God will provide everything you need in life, church, that is when you can start to do what he tells you to do. That is when you can say, I'm going to go preach the gospel, and I don't, care, I don't care what they say to me when I do it, because I know God's got my back. I know I've already got everything I need. And when we get a whole world of people doing that, church, that is when you change things. That is when the world starts to wake up and realize, hey, listen, man, this is pretty cool. Like, this is pretty awesome. The promises of Scripture do come true when you do what God's telling you to do. Turn the treadmill off this morning, church. God, we thank you so much for this word, God. We thank you for everything you're doing in our lives. We thank you for the blessings that you give us, God, that we can't even fully comprehend. It's not always easy, Lord, and you know that. We've been blessed so immensely, God. We've become selfish. We apologize for that, Lord. We ask for your forgiveness for that, God. Open our eyes and allow us to see the people that you've sent us. Show us the people that actually have needs in life, Lord, that you have equipped us to fulfill for them through your son, Jesus. God, use us as nothing more than a vessel to spread your word, love, grace, and mercy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.